O eternal and almighty God, from whom all power and wisdom come, we are assembled here before thee to frame such laws as may tend to the welfare and prosperity of our province. Grant, O merciful God, we pray thee, that we may desire only that which is in accordance with thy will, that we may seek it with wisdom, and know it with certainty, and accomplish it perfectly, for the glory and honor of thy name, and for the welfare of all our people. Amen. Please be seated. The Honorable Official Opposition... Oh, orders of the day. On the uh, Honourable Government, or the Honourable Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On House Business, is there leave of the House to amend the sessional order passed on by the House on September 30th, 2019, as follows? That the sessional order passed in the House on September 30th, uh, 30, 2019, be amended to replace item 1D with the following. D, the House shall not sit on the mornings of Tuesday, October 8th, 2019, and Thursday, October 10th, 2019. Is there leave of the House to amend the sessional order passed by the House on September 30th, 2019, as follows? That the sessional order passed in the House on September 30th, 2019, be amended to replace item 1D with the following. D, the House shall not sit on the mornings of Tuesday, October 8th, 2019, and Thursday, October 10th, 2019. Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. The Honourable Official Opposition House Leader. Miigwech, Madam Speaker, on House Business. On House Business. Is there leave of the House to waive Rule 77, Bracket 3, for the remainder of this session to allow members other than departmental critics to be permitted to speak from a place in the front row of the benches in the chamber? Is there leave of the House to waive Rule 77, bracket 3, for the remainder of this session to allow members other than departmental critics to be permitted to speak from a place in the front row of the benches in the chamber? Agreed? Agreed, Agreed and so ordered. In accordance with the sessional order passed by the House on September 30th, 2019, the House will now resolve into Committee of Supply. Mr. Deputy Speaker, please take the chair.
Will the Committee of Supply please come to order? This section of the Committee of Supply is now resume consideration of the estimates for the Department of Health, Senior and Active Living. At this time, I will invite the ministerial and opposition staff to enter the chamber. I will have the minister now introduce his staff that came into the chamber. Heather and Pete Plaza. The Honourable Minister. Sir, illustrious chair of the committee, um, I would like to introduce uh, this morning with me at the table, I have Deputy Minister of Health, Seniors and Active Living, Karen Hurd. I have Resources and Performance Assistant Deputy Minister Dan Squarchuk. And I have uh, Nathan Clark, Special Assistant and Rocket Man and proud holder of tickets to tonight's Elton John concert. Thank you, Minister. And I'll get the... Uh, because he can afford them. <laughs> The honourable member for uh, Union Station to introduce their, their staff. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. With us this morning, we have Chris Anderson, policy analyst. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, as previously agreed, questions for this department will proceed in a global manner. The floor is now open for questions. The honourable member for Thompson. Thank you. Uh, y yesterday, um, I had asked a question regarding. Uh, the tender for the roof. I was more specifically looking for the tender for the announcement to replace the system that uh, leaked the previous. There was an announcement made that that system was going to be replaced the previous year. The Honourable Minister. Is, uh, Mr. Chair, could the member just repeat the question? There's just a lot of background noise this morning, and uh, I wonder if we could have the microphones turned up at the front desks just so we get less ambient noise and, and more direct. I know this chamber is echoey, but it's, it's hard to hear across the aisle. The Honourable Member for Thompson. I'm uh, looking for the tender that was announced the previous year to replace the HVAC system at the Thompson General Hospital. Minister. Uh, we were discussing at the table, and I understand that there was actually more than one tender posted in respect of the work for Thompson General Hospital, to which the member is referring. Can she clarify which of those uh, solicitations for bids that she's thinking of in specific? The Honourable Member for Thompson. All of them, please.
The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're aware that uh, the request was made by the opposition party today that there will be uh, global questions uh, for regional health authorities, and because of that, we've we've tethered uh, remotely today uh, individuals in in those regional health authorities who will be assisting us remotely. Uh, in this case, we are right now looking for the information the members requesting, but I can indicate that there was indeed a uh, a tender posted on Merck's. Uh, last year, uh, it, pertaining to the to HVAC improvements at Thompson General Hospital, uh, I will confirm, uh, but I am led to believe that the first posting uh, failed to return any. Uh, uh, the solicitation failed to return responses. Uh, uh, then, I believe the work was rescoped and a second contract posted. Uh, now, can the member indicate, was she looking to receive copies of these RFPs? The Honourable Member for Thompson. I'm looking for the copies of the RFPs. Also, could you indicate why uh, the tender was not Why was there no applicants for the tender? The Honourable Minister. 
Uh, thank you. We are still seeking additional information uh, from the Northern Regional Health Authority. What I can tell the member is, first of all, yes, we will provide uh, those postings uh, as they were uh, as they were posted on Merck's. Uh, when we locate those, uh, we may have to provide that information in a uh, subsequent day. We're not sure we'll be able to have it sent to the chamber this morning, uh, but we will provide that information. And here's what we understand about the process. So as the member understands, uh, each region uh, responsible for its own owned and leased assets uh, regularly undertakes to, uh, to invest in those assets. And there's a broad array of, of uh, capital investments uh, for ongoing capital as well as new capital. Uh, those, uh, those needs across the system are organized. They are, uh, they are uh, measured according to the acuity of the need, and then decisions are made uh, on the basis of that information about which to invest in. In this case, uh, our government had prioritized the work uh, for that HVAC repair at, uh, at Thompson Hospital. Uh, we, uh, the region posted that work, and that posting failed to return any applicants for that work. Now, that can be due to a lot of reasons. Uh, I can tell you uh, we were very proud a year earlier of uh, capital repairs that we made, similar repairs, at the Churchill Town Centre. And I was there uh, to see the work uh, being performed at the Churchill Town Center, millions of dollars invested. But at that time, I spoke to Mayor Spence, uh, as well as members of the North, or at that time, members of the WRHA's pl uh, capital planning area, who talked about the complexity of these challenges in letting contracts in the north. Because as the member could understand, uh, I don't know uh, today exactly what the population of, of uh, Churchill is. I believe it's under 1,000 people. Uh, and you can imagine that when you're posting contracts, uh, it can be difficult uh, to uh, procure a company uh, locally uh, to, to undertake that work. The larger the contract, the more complex it becomes in a smaller community or a northern community for that work to be marshaled locally. Now, the same is true for Thompson, much bigger center than Churchill, we all understand. Uh, but the work uh, that was posted had to do with the air conditioning system, upgrades in, uh, in, in piping, uh, upgrades in uh, equipment. Uh, and while I cannot speak to the materiality of that contract right now, I don't know what the scale of that contract was. Uh, in, a, uh, in essence, ultimately, it failed to return contractors. So let's speculate for a moment. That could be because companies who would have bid would have been uh, busy with other contracts uh, because we know that work uh, ebbs and flows in that industry. It could be uh, because uh, there were companies that were calculating their cost uh, to come from the south to the north to undertake that work and uh, they were unable to make that business case for themselves. I don't know those are private companies. It could be uh, that there was a lack of interest on the part of local contractors to be able to accommodate this work or to build workforce in order to accommodate it. But what I can tell the member is, for whatever reason, it happens all the time in government and private industry, sometimes a solicitation for work fails to return applications to bid on that work. And in this case, what was done subsequently is that the work was, and I'm guessing, rescoped or in some way changed or in some way perhaps there could have been interim work to actually work with potential vendors to see how they might be able to make the tender, the solicitation for work, read better. And that work goes on all the time in infrastructure, in education, in healthcare, in sustainable development, in agriculture, right across the landscape of government. And it did in the past and will continue to in the future. Anyways, the, uh, the, the uh, posting was, uh, was put up again a second time on Merck's. We can commit to get both of those postings uh, to the member and we're working for a fuller explanation behind the scenes right now. The Honourable Member for Thompson. I would... Uh has the new tender been awarded? What is the current status of the uh, repairs in the Thompson operating room? And what is the estimated time of the work being completed? 
so Thompson can have access to all four of its surgical units.
The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you. I thank the member for the question. We are uh, just soliciting for that answer. I had a briefing uh, just weeks ago uh, from Helga Bryant, the CEO for Northern Region, uh, to indicate the status of the mitigation work. Uh, I do want to say that, the, uh, as, as background information, the operating room uh, area of Thompson General Hospital was originally built in 1957. Uh, the area, the space was uh, was actually renovated in 1967. Uh, but when I asked about reasons for the failure, I was told that there was actually just engineering flaws in the original design of the building, uh, that it was uh, unwise for the original building schematics to have arranged to run uh, handling units directly over the operating room. Uh, I was told that uh, modern engineering design would never have contemplated such a routing of systems, and I would imagine that now with programs like CAD and AutoCAD, uh, they are able to, in a much more efficient way, uh, run uh, systems past and not over uh, one of the most crucial parts of a hospital. Um, Nevertheless, uh, we were told in August that Northern Region Health Authority predicts a five-month, possibly six-month complete mitigation path, and of course that's not starting now. That was starting from the mitigation. Uh, I have instructed for this work uh, to be undertaken with a very high priority. Uh, the CEO is completely aware, the Board of Directors is completely aware of the need for this to happen. I remind all members that this is not the first time in our province uh, when we have capital programs uh, with uh, competing demands. Uh, our government inherited from the NDP uh, assets of government that had been badly neglected. As a matter of fact, I know that in the first few years of government, uh, our government activated hundreds of millions of dollars of capital repairs to exactly address areas of oversight and neglect by the previous NDP government. We had a press release less than a year ago that talked about roof and HVAC and boiler repairs to schools uh, that were in the hundreds of millions of dollars. In health care, hundreds of millions of dollars of capital repairs for neglected NDP projects. Let me read some of these very good uh, investments into the record. And these include in the northern, I'll be specific to the member's question, in the Northern Region Health Authority. In Flin Flon, the emergency department redevelopment by our government for $24 million. A 1938 wing basement sewer main replacement at Flin Flon Hospital, a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, floor ceiling and lighting upgrades in that hospital for $60,000. Um, an emergency power upgrade phase two at Flin Flon Hospital, $1.5 million. I'm only gonna hit key highlights because there's so many on this list. Thompson, uh, the Northern Crisis Services for Youth at Thompson, a $7.8 million contribution by our government. The redevelopment of the MDR at Thompson General Hospital at, <coughs> at $3.5 million, that's medical device reprocessing. The Chiller Rental at Thompson, a provincial contribution of almost $300,000, $200,000. Vacuum pump replacement at Thompson General Hospital, $137,000. Kitchen ceiling repairs at that hospital of over $12,000. Sewer lift station at Thompson, provincial contribution, $18,000. This does not even get into capital upgrades and repairs that our government is making at places like the Paw and other northern communities, um, including the Missipawistic Cree Nation, $8 million uh, nursing station upgrade, nursing station replacement at Moose Lake, $10 million, uh, lighting retrofits at the PAW. We have Gillum Hospital moisture infiltration mitigation at $300,000, Lynn Lake EMS facility, $678,000. I might actually task my assistant at the table to do a rough calculation of these global invest investments we're making to address issues that were left unaddressed, neglected, 
and ignored by the NDP for years, and we're uh, investing hundreds of millions of dollars in Northern Health, including Thompson, including Thompson General Hospital. We're proud to do those things. The Honourable Member for Thompson. In July, Gordon Jeb had to wait 12 hours to be transported to Winnipeg on life flight, where he later died. This came just days after the government chose to ground the government-owned jets that rely on and rely on privately owned, operated planes. Given the situation of the Thompson operating rooms, where now only uh, op non-urgent surgeries are being redirected to other places, is the government uh, going to reconsider and unprivatize Life Flight, a service that the Northerners depend on? The Honourable Minister. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to have a discussion at the table on the subject of Manitoba's life flight service uh, and, and discuss all of the ways in which this government is uh, improving that service, uh, a legacy service that was constructed back in the 1980s and has never modernized. Uh, and all the ways in which this government's attention to that area is getting better services for Manitobans. Now, the member makes a number of categorical errors in the assertions she just made. Uh, she asked whether the government would reverse the privatization of Life Flight. So we need to start this discussion with a very important clarification for the member. There has been no change to the Life Flight service to privatize the service. No change. There's no change. What has been privatized in Manitoba is the platform. It is the provision of planes, fixed-wing turboprop and jet engine planes. We still have in Manitoba, in the same manner we had before, an array of medical experts, nurse experts, respiratory therapists, principally the doctor, the model is doctor driven. And doctors, emergency doctors, and other doctors, doctors with expertise in things like burn uh, management and dermatology and uh, experts who are internalists and experts who are cardiac experts, uh, essentially in the system signal a desire to work in the area of life flight and become part of that cohort of doctors who then take shifts on call and then are scheduled for flights as need arises. So to be clear, that system continues. That system continues. Uh, the, the taking of calls and the dispatching, the prioritization 
Um, essentially, it's all of that triage that takes place in the same manner as before. Doctors, as the principal means of uh, having medical expertise on planes, but not limited to doctors. We're very proud, by the way, I should say, uh, of the fact that uh, we've been continuing to hire into open positions at Life Flight. I can provide this, uh, this update to, to the member. Uh, I believe that uh, we have filled all the vacancies when it came to those nurse uh, experts who serve in the Life Flight platform, and I'm very pleased to see those positions filled. Uh, but to be clear then, we've delineated no change to how the Life Flight service operates. But what we have done is finally in this province come in line with eight out of ten provinces, including, I would add, Alberta, where for years the NDP government was in power and continued to proudly operate an emergency aviation system whereby the private sector provided the airplanes. So when it comes to critical air ambulance, private carriers are used in the following jurisdictions. BC. Do you know that BC actually right now has an NDP government and yet I have heard no signal from that health minister that somehow they want to immediately move to a government system to own all their planes. The BC government proudly continues to operate a service whereby there is a private provision of planes to operate a provincial service which is called critical air ambulance. But it's not just BC. BC, the Yukon, Alberta, Nova Scotia, Ontario, New Brunswick, Northwest Territories. I would also remind the member that for non-critical ambulance, air ambulance, no provinces have government-owned and operated air services. Here's what I can tell that member. When it comes uh, to the operation of Life Flight, we're improving that system. Finally, we are delimiting our risk of government. We are going to the private sector. We are finally ensuring a minimum standard of plane that will be used for basics and other flights. Under the NDP, no such minimum standards were actually in existence. One could go as far as to say that at times, flight crew, Professionals and patients were put at risk because the government failed to ensure a minimum standard of safety. We are proud of the standards that we can now enforce through the contracts. The system is better than ever, uh, and it's not an ideological debate against private uh, or public. The Honourable Member for Thompson. Does the Minister agree that waiting 12 hours for a life flight or a death situation is too long, and does the Minister agree an inquiry into Mr. Jeb's death should be completed?
The Honourable Minister. Just subsequent to the answer that I offered previously, because the member had asked a question about privatization of the service, I think it would be inappropriate for me to also indicate uh, to the member that even the NDP government previous to this one seemed to not be in agreement with her premise, because I believe it was probably 2011 when the 10-year contract was granted by previous Health Minister Theresa Oswald not to buy Sikorsky or Bell or Airbus helicopters, not to procure its own respiratory therapists, not to procure its own flight teams and build a rotary wing service in this province. Rather, what the former NDP government did is they went to the private sector. They went to the private sector and built in the province of Manitoba a rotary wing service that they uh, give a contract to STARS. Now, we could have a longer contract, a conversation about the nature of that contract because it wasn't tendered. It was a $10 million per year contract on 10 years, $100 million that two years later the public may not know was built even further and with the extension of that contract to 24-hour service and with the application of night vision capability, which sounds pretty cool when you think about it, night vision capability, uh, that that service actually became a $120 million service, untendered on 10 years. As an equivalent, Saskatchewan at the same time, their government was paying approximately one quarter of that amount for a more robust service for that province of approximately the same number of people on the approximately same size of geography as Manitoba. Bad value, but even so the NDP seemed to be a little less ideological than this member because they didn't build a system within the Department of Health. They didn't build a system within the WRHA, one of the regional health authorities. They went to the market. Why did they go to the market? I can only assume that they would have understood that the private sector would have been able to take on all of the risk, like pilot, training, licensing, and standardizing. Um, federal aviation standard compliance payroll, salaries, back office, function, never mind procurement, never mind inventory and fleet, never mind uh, airport authority fees and all the regulatory requirements. Now only think beyond the flight crew what the implications of operating that service is when it comes to a medical provision of care. Building a model, now that model is built on a respiratory therapist model, which uses a high degree of nurse expertise, respiratory therapy expertise, and then doctors. Many people don't recognize that STARS model uses doctors. The issue is this, in Manitoba, we had a legacy model built in the 1980s, which at the time was probably the Cadillac version. Uh, two, I actually believe that originally they could have been Lear jets, but I could be wrong. It could have been Citation jets from the beginning. I believe it initially one and then a second one. Owned by the province, operated by provincial pilots. And a, a system built within the system. A system built within the health system. But 30 years later, when it came time to add a rotary service, a, a service that were, as a government, agnostic about, let the evidence lead the, uh, the, the need for rotary wing. And I think that many communities would now say, yes, this rotary wing service has proven to be a vital part of our overall response in the system. However, think of the, think of the, uh, the uh, inefficiency of the system. Building a rotary wing system by the NDP when they couldn't even land a helicopter at a hospital. They had to land at Winnipeg International Airport and then drive across. There are so many conversations I could invite with that member about this issue of private versus public, where what should be the focus is not the ideology of private versus public, but the focus of results and value and reinvesting into the healthcare system. Uh, I only regret that I may have 
failed to remember the original question asked by the member, so I will invite her patience with me if she could reframe that question. I'm happy to respond to the most recent question she asked about, I believe, an inquiry. The Honourable Member Minister, time Was it about the inquiry? The Honourable Member from Thompson. Um, I would ask for a direct response. I was asking if the minister would consider, if the minister would unprivatize the life flight. The Honourable Minister. I believe the member had asked whether the minister would consider an inquiry into, yes. in, into the situation that has arisen. She should understand that according to the rules, the minister cannot call for an inquiry. The chief medical examiner has not uh, called for an inquiry in this matter. The Honourable Member for Thompson. The minister is correct. That was my question. Okay. Um, the Honourable Member for Thompson. If if ideological means that I stand up for Northern Health, then I'm proud to stand up for Northern Health. I have seen firsthand what the cuts and privatization has done to the North. I have had grieving families at my kitchen table. So I would once again ask the minister to reverse the cuts to Northern patient transport and unprivatize life flights, at which are, their cuts are putting Northern lives at risk. The Honourable Minister. Well, the member is uh, quite wrong. There have been no cuts to the northern patient transportation system, and this government has not uh, privatized uh, the Life Flight program. Uh, the government has gone to the open market. Is very proud to have had the, the market respond. Here's what the member fails to realize. In our discovery work that was undertaken, a very, very significant exercise to understand what was this model for so many years that the NDP expressed an irrational, uh, an almost irrational allegiance to, a failure to modernize that system. What we realized is when it came to Manitoba's basic and low acuity air ambulance program, but also that higher acuity emergency ambulance, air ambulance system, that the NDP government had created a system by which they would simply go to the market and get a plane. You'd go to the market and get a plane. And they were essentially getting a plane, whatever was available, without entering into any contracts or without any kind of attempt to make the market respond to sharpen its pencil and to give a, a competitive bid. They went to the market at market rates on the day of and got what the market would deliver. If that member would go right now on her iPad and try to book a flight to Toronto on Air Canada, she can get one. I bet you she can get one. Same day. But that member and I know that she is going to play, pay an inflated value for the failure to plan. Today that price is worth far more than the price would have been three months ago had she booked it using an online service. Uh, we know this because we're trying to fly two children home at Christmas time, one who studies at University of Waterloo uh, in Ontario and one who studies at, uh, in BC uh, at, at university there. Now, doing that in advance, is way more economical than doing it on the, on the day of. I cannot imagine what it would cost to fly Gwendolyn and Evan home if we booked that flight on December the 13th. It probably cost like 1300 bucks a ticket. Uh, and so that would be very expensive. But it would also mean there would be a lot less value there. And this is the way that the NDP was running the Life Flight Service, but it's also the way the NDP was running the Northern Patient Transportation Program. The NDP had lost discretion over that program and it was hurting the North. It was hurting patients in the North. By failing to go into contracts, by failing to be able to modernize the system by which we take patients and move them to appointments and move them to, uh, to priority appointments in the South and then back again, because remember, the Northern patient transportation system is not life flight. This is a lower acuity. These are scheduled patients. These are dialysis patients who might be coming for checkups with specialists. They are cardiac patients who may be coming to see their specialists or undergo diagnostic testing that isn't available in community. And I, I would invite a conversation about how we're expanding that in places like Dauphin and, and across the whole province as well, including the North. But in this case, 
The Northern Patient Transportation Program, as that member knows, is the subsidy. It's the medical transportation cost for eligible residents in the North. And the NDP had lost discretion on that program, whereby they were allowing uh, the kinds of accompaniments that was never intended. I know this because I reread the rules of the Northern Patient Transportation System. The only thing that officials have done now is said, okay, what, what did the program initially say? What is it designed to do? Let's make sure that we're expressing fidelity to the model of the Northern pa Patient Transportation System. And we're doing that. And by doing that, we're creating capacity in that system. I would welcome a conversation with that member about how we envision in future an ability not just to build things like medical capacity in the North, e-health and digital health to, in, uh, to allow more people to stay home and, and receive their health care in a digital way, and also about how we are modernizing the Northern Patient Transportation System, working with FNIB, working with the regional health authorities to create capacity and to create shorter wait times, more responsive service, and if the member wants to discuss that, we think the, that there's incredibly exciting ways uh, that are taking place right now. Explorations of how to build a better system to get better health care sooner for all Manitobans, including people in the north. The only member for Union Station. In regards to uh, Santé en Francais, it appears as though, uh, according to the uh, Santé en Francais annual report, just looking at um, contributions from health, looks like about a $64,000 less in terms of what's being uh, allocated. I'm wondering if the minister could shed some light on what's going on there, why the, why the decrease in, uh, in the contribution? About $64,000 less. Thank you. The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, can the member indicate uh, the source uh, from which they are uh, referring? To which they're referring? The Honourable Member for Union Station. It's as per public accounts, volume two.
The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I asked for the knowledge of where the, uh, where the member had found that number because I want to clarify that uh, this is the Committee of Supply for Health, and as such, uh, the, the focus is on the examination of the supplementary information for legislative review as presented in these books. Uh, the numbers to which the member are, uh, is referring are not in uh, the SALR. Uh, they are in the public accounts that, was, uh, that were released in Volumes 1 through 4 uh, online one week ago in the province of Manitoba. Now, I have been in this chamber long enough to know because I also have in the Committee of Supply for Health asked questions about the public accounts. and was told that that was out of scope for the purpose of examination. What we do know is that Manitoba is one of the only jurisdictions in Canada, if not the only jurisdiction, where all members of the House do have the opportunity to raise any question they want on the subject of the release of the public accounts. The public accounts were released in accordance with the rules of this assembly uh, by the end of September, and I believe that both the chair and deputy chair of the Public Accounts Committee will now be scheduling when, this gets confusing because the name of the committee and the name of the report are the same, but when the province's public accounts, the accounting for that fiscal year, will appear as the only consideration item at that committee hearing. So that member will have a chance to go line by line on any variance she sees. For the purpose of this discussion, though, here's what I would want the member to understand about grants, because this is a grant that they are referring to for Santé en Français, but it is not even a grant made to Santé en Français. In this case, the member is talking about a grant made through finance in Area 21 Dash one C dash two to the Conseil Communauté en, Sa en Santé, the CCS, uh, in order to provide support services to seven designated bilingual regional health authorities for the delivery of French language services in accordance with the provincial French language services policy. So the member is talking about a variance that they see. But I can tell you there's lots that goes on behind the scenes. For, as a matter of fact, Santé en Francais has received funding through shared health from the federal government for a more recent exploration of how French language services in health can be explored and enhanced within a granting area through a third party to Santé en Francais I would say very emphatically that we will not have the ability in this deliberation today uh, to consider the point she's making, but I do refer her, I refer them to the public accounts, which should be advertised shortly, which should be advertised shortly, where all members can ask questions pertaining to variances they see uh, in the public accounts as uh, presented in those documents. The Honourable Member for Union Station. So, I, just speaking specifically to this to this one line, which is health, and and identifying that, and, and the minister can see what it is I'm talking about in terms of the sixty-four thousand dollars less. Um, can the minister provide whether or not this amount? It looks like it decreased from two hundred fifty-four thousand five hundred to one hundred ninety thousand eight hundred seventy-five dollars. Can the minister provide whether or not this will continue to decrease moving forward? And I, and I do understand what the, the, the minister is, is, is saying in terms of uh, public accounts, et cetera. However, this is, this is a specific line under health, and uh, I think the minister should be able to identify whether or not moving forward those funds will continue to decrease. Mr. Chair, I just want to uh, clarify from the member if, uh, can, can you specifically indicate which uh, document that you would have um, got the information from. Member for Union Station. Member for, you want a member for Union Station? Yeah, this is, this is as per the annual report, Santé en Francais. Okay. Thank you.
Minister. Can the member clarify if would the member clarify if the annual report to which they're referring is the 2017-2018 uh, report or the 2018-2019 report? The Honourable Member for Union Station. 2017-2018 report. The Honourable Minister. And what is the member using as a reference to demonstrate what she's alleging is a decrease in funding? What, what's the other reference point? Oh, there. The other member for Union Station. Um, just a, a reminder, and I know the minister has been working on it, but you've misgendered me. The minister has misgendered me now three or four times this morning alone. So I would appreciate uh, maybe a bit more of an effort in referring to me as they, them. Those are my pronouns. Um, so 2017 2018, as per the annual report, Santé en Francais was 24,500. As per public, uh, accounts 2018-2019 is $190,875. The Honourable Minister. So the member is using a uh, historical document, a 2017-2018 report from the organization itself, and then using as the other reference point the public accounts as released one week ago uh, by the Government of Manitoba. Uh, and making the correlation between the two documents. I have indicated to the member uh, that for the purpose of this discussion, the public accounts is out of scope. Uh, this is an examination of the uh, estimates of expenditure for the Department of Health. Uh, what I am doing, I'm doing it uh, consistent with advice offered to me when I also was a critic in the, in the discussions. We do not have at this table the public accounts. We do not have at this table uh, the Auditor General, uh, sorry, we don't have the, uh, the Comptroller's Office. So uh, Mr. Aurel Tess, the Chief Provincial Comptroller, does not sit at this table. Mr. Jim Richishan, uh, the Deputy Minister of Finance, does not sit at this table. Neither do we have access at this table to the public accounts. And so I would ask the member again to avail themselves of the opportunity to ask these questions at the appropriate time, which would be in the committee uh, that is in this province and almost uniquely as a facet of this legislature, uh, this committee dedicated to the examination of the public accounts, which I assume would be coming up within the next eight to 12 weeks. Yeah, I just want to remind every member here that uh, this is the one that we're going to be using is the Manitoba Health Senior and Active Living Supplementary Information of Legislative Review for the, uh, for the, uh, for the purpose of estimates. So we can refer, keep, keep on, the, the, um, on that um, path. Okay. The other member for Union Station. Can the minister uh, point us in the direction of where we would find uh, then that information that would, would shed some light on what we can anticipate will be contributed from health? Thank you.
The Honourable Minister. Uh, I don't know if I can be helpful to the member in terms of the reference, uh, other than to say that they should, of course, wait for the publication of Santé en France annual report for the current uh, year. But I can say this, at the table we have been able to consider here and give some deliberation to this matter outside of the discussion of public accounts, and that I can say to the member that uh, we are unaware of any reduction to the baseline grant to not Santé en, uh, but, but to Santé en France by the government of Manitoba, and that uh, that baseline grant remains at approximately $255,000. Uh, and that um, beyond that, uh, the member would probably be best to wait for the release of the annual report. The honourable member for Union Station. So this did arise uh, yesterday. I think there was a, a mention the minister made about uh, shortage in the uh, pneumococcal uh, immunizations. Or the, the flu vaccines, and um, I'm wondering if the minister can you talk a bit about um, plans surrounding that, because we do know that there, obviously there's been a delay in the rollout of the flu vaccine. Um, the minister um, hopefully can provide an update to the House on what is being done uh, to address the fact that, uh, and I believe it was, he said it yesterday, there's a, a shortage, um, and perhaps that's what's been contributing to the delay in the rollout of the vaccine. Um, so can the minister provide an update on this delay, uh, just in terms of how much of the vaccine is being delayed actually, um, and for how long it's being delayed? And uh, what does the minister plan to do to uh, help address this? The Honourable Minister. For a few days now, um, Canadians have become aware uh, that all manufacturers supplying Canada uh, with influenza vaccine are experiencing shortage and delays in the v delivery of vaccine for a variety of reasons. Uh, this will, of course, result in delay of vaccine delivery not just to Manitoba, but, but to all provinces and territories. Uh, it may also impact the volume of vaccine that was anticipated in Manitoba, 
Uh, but before that starts to sound alarmist, I would want to add, and the member will know, that we have a very good reputation in Manitoba in terms of the, uh, the framework and organization that we have in place for the, procu for the planning, for the planning, for the procurement, and for the strategic distribution of vaccine throughout the province. As a matter of fact, as the former Minister of Finance, I was somewhat surprised to find out that the warehousing for vaccine in the province of Manitoba is not undertaken by health. The warehousing for vaccine is actually undertaken by Accommodation Services Division at locations that I won't divulge, but with redundancies built in for the safe storage uh, and you can imagine why you'd want redundancy in vaccine storage, so that if there was some uh, issue that arose on one site, you would be able to point to other sites. And then, of course, distribution becomes so essential, because we know that once distribution is sent from site, it cannot be clawed back. Now, I'm thinking back a number of years here. Uh, we know the bird flu epidemic a number of years ago, the, the avian flu. Uh, I can recall uh, issues with supply uh, when the NDP were in power. These aren't political issues. They are issues that do arise, and they're concerning to the population. Uh, but in those cases, as now, what happens is that Immediately, resources are marshaled in order for the, the, the provinces and ter territories that are affected by the situation are working together, working with the manufacturers. In this case, I believe two manufacturers uh, in particular who are experiencing issues with, uh, with production. Uh, in order to uh, maximize uh, the inventory in their own jurisdictions and then to make strategic decisions to allocate the virus on hand to the, uh, to the best use, in other words, to the highest case need. In this case, when it comes to uh, influenza virus, that would mean that that, virus is being prior that vaccine is being prioritized for the very old, for the infirm, for those in personal care home, for the elderly in a hospital, for the very young, for individuals uh, with immune systems that are depressed. Uh, in the meantime, I can provide the following uh, update. We understand that the, the supply situation has been evolving on a daily basis. I can tell that member and all members of the House uh, that all jurisdictions are coordinating and collaborating on a daily basis on this issue. Uh, we have now heard that each of the four vaccine products that we were to receive uh, have been at least delayed on the manufacturer's end. So we are working uh, to uh, understand what the impact of this will be. Uh, and we are working to mitigate along with the manufacturer uh, as quickly as we can. So as updates come available, I'll be happy to provide them. We are working, like I said, with the federal government and provinces uh, on this. Uh, I could also, for the uh, member, indicate the two companies uh, in particular who are experiencing the issues with production, and they are AstraZeneca, and GlaxoSmithKline GSK. The honourable member for Union Station. Uh, the minister mentioned that uh, has mentioned that there uh, has been a bit of a delay in advertising around the flu. Just wondering how long that delay will be for, and will the province the province be advertising once? <clears throat> Well, advertising as usual, rather, once they have enough vaccine in hand, will they move forward with uh, typical advertising? The Honourable Minister. Certainly, I concur with the member that we, we want to make sure that Manitoba's advertising campaign, which is very important for, for a vaccine and for influenza, an annual campaign that reminds Manitobans of the importance of getting their flu shot. As a matter of fact, last year in the city of Morton, I had a, the opportunity to go to a local pharmacist. I believe that my chief of staff was there that day. Uh, no, he declined to come. <laughs> I believe that my press secretary and, uh, and uh, my uh, executive assistant was there that day. We had a good exchange with, with the pharmacist. 
pharmacist. Uh, we know in this province, pharmacists are able, of course, to provide flu shots to all Manitobans. No need to go to a doctor's office. Nevertheless, we know at the end of the day, Manitobans have a variety of options from which they can choose to uh, have their flu shot administered. Their uh, doctor, nurse practitioner, their community pharmacist, public health, and a variety of other means. Uh, however, of course, vaccine is not the only protection that we have against flu. We know that there is a variety of protocols that we remind Manitobans through this advertising campaign to adhere to. Washing your hands, coughing into your arm and not into your hand, and, and when you know that you're sick. <laughs> Let the record show that one of the officials at my table uh, coughed into their sleeve at exactly the moment I was saying that, uh, thus demonstrating the efficacy of that technique. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the importance of the advertising campaign can't be overstated. Uh, to the members concerned, I, I concur wholeheartedly. Uh, while we know that ad buys are made in advance, we don't want to have an ad buy that is demonstrating that people should rush out to get their vaccine if, in, if it is in case, uh, if it is in fact the case that that vaccine when they get there won't be available, or that it's uh, rather, I should say because it needs to be made clear. There is vaccine in jurisdiction right now. The issue is about supply and demand. So we are at this time looking into the program and the advertising to know if we can uh, better fit that program to commence with the arrival of vaccine in jurisdiction. I saw as well a member of the opposition just now cough or sneeze into their sleeve, thus also indicating that this is an issue on which all parties are in agreement, the need to adhere to the protocols on coughing into your sleeve. Uh, and this is only the start, I believe, of many other areas of shared uh, values and principles and uh, willingness to work together in this new 42nd legislature of the province of Manitoba. It's an exhausting example. <laughs> it's not the only example. Uh, however, so I think what I would say is I would land on this. First things first, uh, and by first things first, what I mean is that uh, what I mean is that uh, we need to uh, ascertain better the shipping schedule for vaccine. We don't know uh, the volume of doses that will be received by Manitoba. We do not know the date by which these doses will be received. We do not then know the shipping schedule and Manitoba seniors, uh, health seniors and active living uh, will be updating the public on distribution timelines uh, as more information becomes available. Uh, I want to provide a slight correction to the record so that we don't have uh, publicly traded companies contacting us. Please correct the information I, prior, I gave prior. The companies in question are GlaxoSmithKline GSK, Sanofi, and Securus Canada. So please strike from your records that AstraZeneca example. That company is not one of those involved in uh, I'm just gonna, flu vaccine. Sorry, to interrupt. Um, we actually had the clock stop. We thought you were finished, so we're we're done now. Okay, for, now we'll go on to the honour member for Union Station. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I grew concerned when I saw how much time was left and thought I have to be listening to. And it's okay. Anyway. Um, Question for the minister, still on the topic of the pneumococcal immunizations. Um, we know that the immunizations have declined from 69.5% in 2014 and 15 to 61.2% in 2017, 2018. During the last flu season, uh, Mr. Clute told the media that they are seeing higher than normal respiratory illness presentations at hospital. Can the minister explain then why the use of immunizations that might address this has declined by 8.3% over the last few years? It's especially important to uh, identify heading into a flu season that can be very hard on Manitobans. Thank you.
The Honourable Minister. I can tell the member that based on data from Manitoba's immunization strategy, that, uh, which is a component of public information management system, uh, that when it comes to infant and early childhood vaccine uptake, uh, that uptake remains stable. I can indicate to the member that, uh, uh, that there is some slow decline uh, on preschool boosters. Uh, I know that when it comes to the school immunization program that there is variation uh, on uptake. Uh, I know that uh, from the information I have, grade 6 vaccine uptake remains relatively stable, uh, while when it comes to grade 8 and 9 rates, that, that rate is declining. Uh, I would also, though, want to say uh, that there is, um, that there is uh, a trend line not just in Manitoba, but across Canadian provinces and indeed beyond our borders. Uh, and that member and I will both know that there is uh, ongoing, uh, ongoing debate on a global stage. Uh, it is a complex uh, issue when it comes to a vaccine and, and uh, influenza vaccine even. Uh, that debate includes areas of efficacy, uh, we know that it has not helped in previous years where research has subsequently pointed to the fact that the particular strain that we saw in jurisdictions was not the strain that had been vaccinated against. I only mention that in order to say that that kind of thing tends to run counter to public confidence in system. We know that vaccine uh, is a complicated area of science where, whereby we're working in real time to, to, to develop and then distribute vaccine in time to be able to respond to what we believe will be the pre predominant strains in jurisdictions. Um, I can also say to the member uh, that in the province of Manitoba, Generally speaking, when it comes to um, how we're working with partners, I can tell the member that I become more aware in my role that we do follow the evidence in this province. And where we see, for instance, that there is vaccine uptake diminishing, we can, in regions and through public health, address that. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking this morning of the Manitoba Association for Senior Centers, and Connie Newman is their, I believe, executive director may be her title. And Connie Newman is working very collaboratively with her organization, working with the provincial government, working with public health in order to convey this message out to senior centers about the importance for seniors to get their flu shot. Not just working to communicate the need, but facilitating flu shots in seniors' centers. As a matter of fact, I was most recently in the local senior center less than one week ago, and I, I believe I saw the poster for this of when this would be coming to this center. I think that's a fantastic way. I was at an assisted living complex uh, in the last couple of weeks where they were advertising to the residents of the assisted living complex that they would be vaccinating in the facility. What a great way to get to the population and make, instead of making the population come to them. Uh, but we're also working with other organizations across that. We work with public health, of course. There are ways to intervene and additionally advertise or create resource where we notice those uh, numbers are low. Uh, so I would say this as well, that citing the source of the Center for Disease Control website, uh, coverage uh, for 2017-2018 uh, was lower for every age group compared to the 2016-2017 season. And that for all adult age groups, flu vaccination coverage estimates in the 2017-2018 season were at their lowest levels compared with these seven prior flu seasons. And for the 2017-2018 season, flu vaccination coverage, coverage increased with age from 26.9% among adults 18 to 49 years old to 59.6% among adults greater than 65 years old. The Honourable Member for Union Station. So I'm glad the, the Minister um, brought up the importance of seniors accessing the pneumococcal immunizations. Um, the, the information that I'm referencing is specific to 65 plus demographic. So again, if, if the minister could explain why the use of immunizations within that age demographic, so 65 plus, 
has declined 8.3% over the last few years, that'd be great. The Honourable Minister. So, uh, to be clear, I was reading into the record uh, results that are reported publicly through the United States Center of Disease Control. So this is uh, analytics and data taken from the entire examination of the U.S. population of 300 plus million people. Uh, we're, we're looking towards trend lines. Uh, what, what my uh, point is that I'm making is that while for all the reasons I discussed, we remain concerned and are responding in this jurisdiction, uh, clearly the evidence shows that beyond our own borders with much more significant populations, we are seeing much of the same. That baselining against the previous seven flu seasons, we see that diminishing of uptake in the adult age population and we see the flu vaccination coverage increasing in older adults. It's a trend that we're seeing, and I'm happy to discuss further uh, uh, some hypothesis uh, around what the data is continuing to disclose. The Honourable Member for Union Station. I can appreciate um, the information that the Minister is uh, sharing and where it comes from. I'm speaking specifically to Manitoba, I'm speaking specifically to seniors in Manitoba. And so I, would, I can, would appreciate now if the minister could speak specifically to seniors in Manitoba. He just stated that he went into seniors' homes. He saw a lot of advertising in senior homes in Manitoba, hoping uh, to ensure that seniors in Manitoba are aware that it's the importance of uh, accessing a vaccine that can help them during uh, peak critical health times in our province when seniors uh, can be at greater compromised levels due to a number of factors. And uh, so I'm going to ask this again, if the minister could explain why the use of immunizations that might address increased issues around respiratory illness in those who are in the age demographic of 65 plus, very vulnerable populations for any number of reasons, um, that would be really, really wonderful. And again, sticking to Manitoba based information would be greatly appreciated. The Honourable Minister. No dispute with, uh, with the member and anything they said about uh, the need to protect, uh, better protect uh, vulnerable residents, uh, the elderly. Uh, and that is why uh, on September 5th of last year, actually on September 5th of 2017, uh, Manitoba became the first province in Canada to introduce the high dose flu vaccine to better protect vulnerable residents and personal care homes from uh, influenza. Uh, we know as the member clearly said, that it, a study showed that people over the age of 65 that live in personal care homes are most at risk of complications or death related to influenza. And that is why our province was the very first province to introduce this new type of vaccine to better protect those vulnerable people and keep them healthy when the flu starts to circulate in the winter time. Uh, when uh, that was done, uh, we know that, uh, that the decision was made uh, to offer that high-dose seasonal influenza vaccine uh, to everyone living at a personal care home. Uh, we know that that high dose provides a higher level of protect, uh, protection against types of influenza, uh, and that we know as well 
uh, that um, lower respiratory tract infections, including pneumonia, including bronchitis, uh, are the leading cause of hospital admissions in adults age 65 or older, uh, especially in older and frail uh, Manitobans and especially during peak influenza season. So the member asks, what is the government doing? I could submit that the government is doing more than anyone else. The very first province to indicate that they would put in place this high dose vaccine for Manitobans. Two years into this program, it has proved to be a success. We are getting that uptake of seniors uh, agreeing and consenting to take this. And, um, and, uh, and so we think it's a success story. There's more to do, certainly, but this indicates that uh, it helps. Coming back to the Manitoba Association of Senior Centers, as I said, just another way in which our government is cooperating uh, with outside groups as well. And as I said, in this case, the Manitoba Center Association of Senior Centers is helping to advertise and helping to accommodate a flu vaccine to be administered to older adults in the province of Manitoba. And it's interesting, although we say the Senior Center Association, I heard Connie Newman most recently refer to older adults. So she said that may be the new term that we have to use. So for the member for Elmwood, or the member for Morton Winkler, or the member for River Heights, or the member behind me for Midland, uh, the member for Selker, we might have to refer to older adults. Of course, that may not include, for instance, the new member for Lajah Motier. The honorable member for Union Station. So it's, it's clear that uh, the minister is not going to provide a, a, a clear response on what their plan is and what his plan is to address the fact that there are less people re receiving uh, the vaccinations, the immunizations. Um, you know, the percentage has declined 8.3% over the last few years. There are less folks who are 65 years and older receiving the pneumococcal immunizations and uh, it doesn't seem as though the minister will be providing any explanation as to why this is taking place or as to how that's going to change. Heading into a, uh, a flu season, uh, one in which I'm sure we all have uh, folks who are 65 years and older in our lives that we worry about their health and we're concerned about how the flu season might impact them. It would have been great to have some clarity around this. Doesn't appear as though I'm going to receive that from the minister today, however. So I'll move on to um, a question that I have for the minister around the upgrades at St. Boniface Emergency Room. Wondering if the minister could provide a status update on the upgrades to the St. Boniface Emergency Room. Uh, we did have previous information in regards to what was going on in the phases. Uh, so if the minister could provide a clear update on the status of the the upgrades to the St. Boniface emergency room. Um, certainly heading into flu season, we know that's an emergency room that is going to be uh, increasingly accessed by members of the population. Of course, members of the senior population. So having a clear understanding of where those upgrades are at and also knowing that uh, it still continues to be understaffed, I think it'd be wonderful to know what the status of the emergency room at St. Boniface Hospital is and what people can expect. The Honourable Minister. I'll respond in two parts. First, uh, I will comment on the statements of the member uh, just previous. Uh, I disagree with their assessment that somehow I wasn't providing information. The member's question was, what is this government doing to plan for uh, enhanced uptake of virus among Manitoba's oldest uh, people, uh, elderly pe persons, people in personal care homes? And I spoke very directly to them about the fact that our government was the very first in Canada to provide this flu zone HD, extending to personal care homes this uh, special booster, this, this high dose shot. And the uptake is considerable. It is considered to be a success story. 
Uh, also, I indicated partnerships like the ones we have with uh, Manitoba Association for Seniors Centre. I'm noting that on their website right now, the Manitoba Association for Seniors Centre has a direct link to a, a study called The Underappreciated Burden of Influenza Among Canada's Older Population and What We Need to Do About It, including links to sites, including resources, and this is a very significant piece of work on their website. Uh, including talking about vaccine policies in Canada and evidence-informed recommendations just like the one we made. We take the issue seriously, we have acted, we'll continue to act. When it comes to the second part of the question then pertaining to the uh, St. Boniface uh, Hospital emergency room, this work has to be de de divided into two parts. Uh, first of all, there is the capital uh, improvements that this government is proud to have been making to the uh, new emergency to establish the new emergency minor treatment area. Uh, we uh, want to say very clearly, this is related to the transformation of our health care system. That in the considerable conversations that we have had over the course of the last four days, five days, um, hours and hours and estimates. We have had the opportunity to discuss why we are changing the look and the feel and uh, the way we locate resources uh, in the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority and then, of course, in, se in successive waves across the province. Why? Because we had a health care system built in the 1950s that put the emphasis on hospitals and said the hospitals should duplicate everything. And there was perhaps a good rationale in the 1950s for that. As a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Brock Wright of Shared Health spoke on the subject two days ago at one of our regional health authorities' annual meetings, and he said exactly this. Our health, systems, our health system put hospitals in the center of the system for years and years and years, starting in the 50s and re-emphasized in the 60s. But healthcare has changed. And that is why our government's decision on the basis of evidence on the basis of careful planning, on the basis of acting on a report received from the NDP government, a report by one Dr. David Peachy, formerly of Ontario, now of Nova Scotia, we acted to, re to coordinate and reorganize the system to place more acute health care resources in specialized hospital, tertiary hospitals, if you will, and then locate subacute services including the new urgent care center at Concordia Hospital, including the new urgent care uh, center at Seven Oaks Hospital, uh, at other community hospitals. And part of this work was then, of course, to make the ancillary improvements to those tertiary hospitals, anticipating the growth in volume. That's what we've done. And some of those changes, for instance, are the new emergency minor treatment area that the member just referred to. Uh, the first phase of this $5 million expansion to the emergency department uh, is now complete. The next phase is enhanced mental health treatment space in October of 2019. In addition to that, of course, the bigger, very significant uh, announcement that our government made in August of this year, and I know it's one that the member will want me to emphasize again, is a $90 million new emergency department at the St. Boniface Hospital to reduce wait times by providing a modern design that improves patient flow in a larger space for clinical staff to work in. The Wait Times Reduction Task Force recommended construction of a new department. They noted that it was essential to increasing system capacity, ensuring lower wait times that come with a fully integrated, patient-focused health care system. The cost of the project, of course, is subject to tendering. We've estimated it at $90 million. But to be clear, this project was on the books for years and years in the NDP, and it took a PC government to move forward on it. The Honourable Member for Union Station. Union Station. What is the status of the women's hospital? The Honourable Minister. I will respond in two parts, uh, simply to tack on to the explanation I just gave. 
Compare and contrast the approaches of the two parties in the, in the month of August and incidentally, or maybe not incidentally, on the exact same day that our party announced a $90 million St. Boniface Hospital as part of a $2 billion health care guarantee to Manitobans. The NDP made an announcement in the same park in St. Boniface, Kitty Corner, to the hospital. And what was their uh, announcement? Was it also a $2 billion funding guarantee to health care? No. It was a scheme by which the leader of the opposition said you could gain the system to get free parking if you knew how to cheat the system. In the press availability, the member said, look, we'll give you two hours parking. Understanding as he did, as the leader of the opposition did, that parking lots are not owned by the hospitals. In most cases, they're owned by the foundation. There was, it was obvious the very first day that they had done absolutely no coordination with foundations. Foundations were shocked and appalled because foundations do so much in this province, in this city. I'm thinking of the Bethesda Community Foundation in Steinbach that's given $5 million to a new personal care home construction. These foundations are generous and use the small amounts of revenue they gain through operation of things like parking lots to reinvest immediately in the healthcare system. The leader of the opposition said, my response to a $2 billion guarantee in funding, including a $90 million uh, emergency department for St. Boniface by the PC party, will be a parking lot subsidy, but only for two hours, but if you know how to game the system and you're unethical, you can do it. Compare and contrast the approaches of our government. We were proud to stand with board members and the board chair for St. Boniface. I believe the WRHA also had capital planning people there that day, but before they make any inference, there was no uh, interference because the members did not attend. I, I, and I should say that, not operationally. Only the board chair attending that, uh, that event and not by the invitation by our party, but on their own behalf and on their own uh, uh, on their own time. Uh, we were proud to stand that day and announce that significant investment. And it should be known. It was a capital plan that remained on the books for years and years and years under the former government. And remember that the premier of this province for seven years, or maybe six, was the member for St. Boniface who never saw his way forward to actually make this investment right under his nose two blocks down from where he had his constituency office. We're proud of the investment we're making. When it comes to the member's question about the women's hospital, the Premier and I and other members of our caucus, including the member for Riel, were, uh, were proud to tour the women's hospital uh, and to see uh, the, the hospital coming uh, coming up, there is a process by which a hospital is completed and then essentially the contractor hands back the keys uh, for a period of time in which they, which they call commissioning of a hospital uh, because of the technical complexity of operating a hospital and the need to uh, determine with a high degree of confidence that the hospital will be open and operating well when it's open to, to the public. At that time, a number of months ago, it was determined uh, that the hospital would be ready to open on December the 1st. The latest update I have received is that they are on time and still gearing up to open this $233 million women's hospital uh, in December after years and years of delay under the NDP. When you talk about capital planning, and the member for Thompson talked about capital planning, what a series of missteps, what a series of bumbling and missing targets and overspending. I became aware that as a result of a failure of the NDP to plan comprehensively for the needs of the Bannatyne campus, the cost of the women's hospital was unnecessarily inflated by tens of millions of dollars of additional expense that were stopgap attached to the project. We're proud of this investment at 665 William. We're proud that it will be working for all Manitobans for years to come. And we're proud that we're continuing to see that it will be open to the public by December 1st, as was articulated by our government earlier. The order member for Union Station. Thank you uh, to the minister for that 
answer. Um, I've worked in healthcare as a, a psychiatric nurse for over a decade, and, uh, and before that, obviously, I was in nursing school. So, although I can appreciate that the minister has a lot of information about healthcare he likes to share, I think that I would appreciate even greater if he uh, could keep his responses fairly direct. Uh, I have a pretty good understanding of our healthcare system, and so a lot of his preamble is, is uh, not necessarily pertinent to providing some of the response. Um, to that, I'd like to ask about the uh, Diagnostic Centre of Excellence and the status of that. We were told the building was largely complete in 2016, but that the top three floors had not yet been occupied. Is there anything on those floors, and, and what is the plan? Thank you. The Honourable Minister. Provide an, uh, an answer to that question in the time remaining. I only regret that the time remaining will not be sufficient. Our government is so proud of the investments that we have made. Oh, thank you. I was just reminded that these proceedings go until 12.30, not 12. It gives me at least a few minutes to discuss the very significant investments that our government is making at the Diagnostic Centre of Excellence. Another project I should add that was over budget and over the time period allotted, uh, a capital debacle under the NDP, whereby the project was so inflated in cost that the NDP lacked the ability to finish out the project. The member asked questions about the open floors. The member must be reminded that the reason the floors were left unfinished is because the NDP was so over budget on the project that the system finally seized up on the expenditure and our government inherited that mess, went to work on capital planning, found the dollars, and I am delighted to say engaged with private partnerships with philanthropists across Manitobans to help us finish out those areas. I want to talk about one of those areas that was finished recently. It was my absolute delight in December of last year to join the Premier, to join uh, Paul Albrechtson, and we all miss Paul Albrechtson so much, and uh, our condolences again to his family. Paul Albrechtson was a gifted, entrepreneur in the province of Manitoba who loved this province, loved the people. And he used to say, it was his expression about the philanthropy that he demonstrated so well towards the end of his life and before that, that he wanted to give with a warm hand rather than a cold one. And, uh, and Paul did. He gave generously and he gave to a project at the Diagnostic Center of Excellence on December the 11th a $5 million donation to help us finish out new interventional angiography facilities and unveil new equipment. Now, to those who don't know this technology, interventional angiography is the practice of diagnosing and treating patients through within their blood vessels. So interventional angiography procedures widen the narrowed blood vessels. It keeps blood flowing to arms, legs, and other parts of the body. Bleeding can be halted from blood vessels when other methods are not successful. Clots can be broken up that threaten life and limb. But these are not just angiography suites. This is cutting edge equipment. It is equipment that before now did not exist in Manitoba. I asked Dr. Perry Gray, who is in the position of Chief Medical Officer for Health Sciences Center for Shared Health Now, I asked Perry Gray, what will these suites and what, the, what will this equipment do? And I will never forget his response. He said, Minister, this equipment and these suites at the Diagnostic Center of Excellence will save lives and will return people to full function who otherwise and before would have died or would have been permanently impaired. And we all have stories of people that we know who have, studied, who have suffered stroke and cardiac arrest and had trauma and, um, and professionals, despite their best efforts, were unable to fix the bleeds. The fact of the matter is, because of our planning and because of Paul Albrechtson's generous award, that these investments are now coming into this suite 
uh, of, of uh, spaces. I toured that space in the Diagnostic Center of Excellence when it was open to the ceiling, exposed concrete, lighting conduit hanging down, and no plan left to us by the former NDP government to finish out that space. As a matter of fact, we had to vote special authority, which we did, and still met our budgetary targets, to pay for the equipment. Because the NDP, because of failure to manage, has actually run out of money before they could buy the specialized equipment that was intended for the space. And I can tell you that that equipment now comes on the line, and I am humbled to think about the thousands of Manitobans that will be treated in future and for whom this will make a difference. Not only that, but the Diagnostic Center of Excellence will now work in tandem with the new acute stroke unit at Health Sciences Center that our government was proud to announce earlier this spring. The member from Union Station. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the... The situation in, in Manitoba, the situation in Winnipeg in regards to uh, acute mental health issues and uh, acute issues around addictions, problematic substance use and addictions are, are top of mind for pretty much anyone you speak with. And uh, the minister in, in previous days has, um, you know, talked at length about the changes with AFM that would increase accessibility to different addictions counselors. Um, talked about AFM, you know, beds being utilized in different ways. I'm wondering, in the midst of an addictions, what some are calling an addictions crisis, what some are calling a meth crisis, certainly a crisis of, um, you know, fundamental issues in terms of uh, people having their basic needs met, um, you know, unmet mental health needs, um, issues surrounding um, trauma, you know, adverse childhood experiences, um, complex issues surrounding uh, development in, in youth and teens well into adulthood that can rear their head as addictions and problematic substance use. Um, I'm curious if the minister could shed some light then on why the uh, Addictions Foundation of Manitoba saw, I believe it's a $2 increase in funding from 2017 and 18 to 2018 and 19. The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Acting Chair, I, I welcome an opportunity to talk about mental health and addictions and the response of our government uh, to the continued need in our province uh, for access to services. Uh, the member knows that in this chamber over the past few years, uh, we've had uh, a lot of examination of and dialogue around and debate around uh, the work undertaken by our government uh, in respect of the Virgo report. The Virgo report, uh, the Virgo team, the Virgo planning and evaluation consultants uh, provided the Minister of Health, Seniors and Active Living with a report entitled Improving Access and Coordination of Mental Health and Addiction Services, a Provincial Strategy for All Manitobans in 2018. Uh, the Virgo report, when it returned its master report, a report that was released to Manitobans by our government in an exercise of transparency, uh, it sets out a bold, forward-looking plan to address the silos and gaps that have created significant challenges for Manitobans in accessing the services they need when they need them. Uh, this was a very significant exercise, the first of its kind to this uh, extent in Manitoba. 350 in-person consultations. 3,800 rep uh, responses to the online survey, 600 individuals engaged in a series of validation events, 275-plus data and document review processes. And what did the report say? Well, it acted as, among other things, an indictment of the efforts of the former NDP government. It said that Manitoba's health care and addiction system for years was not able to meet the province's current level of need. Reports said how badly aligned our system had been for years. And it talked about the fact that it was decades behind for years and years when it came to addictions system. It provided a list of evidence-based recommendations, uh, recommendations that our government is implementing uh, on the short term and over the long term in order to create capacity, in order to create access. And I can tell you, and I have told the members, how it is that uh, aspects of our government's approach, like the rapid access to addictions medicine clinics across the province, uh, two in Winnipeg, one in Brandon, one in Thompson, one in Selkirk, and now one articulated for the southern region, continue to treat individuals for seeking help for substance-related addictions in a manner that was never contemplated before, <laughs> bringing services around the individual rather than making the individual go site to site to site and experience gap and gap after gap when it comes to receiving services. Our province signed on to the Emergency Treatment Fund bilateral agreement, which uh, we're using to establish flexible length withdrawal management services and recovery beds in Winnipeg and Brandon. In the last election, we actually promised an extension of that flex length withdrawal management services uh, capacity. We're very proud of that. We've had the discussions here with members in the chamber about why flexible length services are important for addressing issues like addiction to methamphetamines. We've added six mental health inpatient beds at Health Sciences Center. We have tripled the number of women's treatment beds from 12 to 36 at AFM's Portage Avenue site because the Virgo report in specific cited the need for the increase of services for women and for indigenous peoples and these investments are helping to fill both of those needs. We have equipped paramedics with olanzapine to treat agitated patients who are at risk of developing meth psychosis. Uh, we have, uh, as we said, uh, we've been working to be able to bring closer to home treatment for individuals who are complex in nature and have gone through our system. And we remain dedicated to efforts to bring that treatment capacity uh, closer to home. But in the campaign itself, we also announced what is perhaps our most significant to date response to the overall issue a comprehensive STEM to Stern. Uh, multi-departmental, uh, whole-of-government response responding to the Virgo report, which we have called our Safer Streets, Safer Lives Action Plan, in respect just of health care. This represents the following investments, but not uh, solely these. A new acute medical sobering facility, the first of its type in Manitoba. New recovery and drop-in centers. Flexible length withdrawal services expanded. Uh, 
a new RAM clinic in Manitoba, supportive recovery housing units, which are badly needed, and anti-drug youth initiatives. I tell that member and all members of the House, stay tuned as early as next week when we continue to discuss how this government is reacting. The other member for Union Station. So we're, we're all, you know, if you know about um, the, the, uh, the root causes, uh, conversations on the root causes of addictions, problematic substance use, you know, we, we know and we understand that these issues uh, take place long before adulthood. Uh, there are a number of youth in our, in our city, in our province, who are struggling with problematic substance use and addictions, youth who are targeted and marginalized and, uh, you know, for example, who are being sexually exploited. Um, youth who are in precarious housing situations, lacking the supports that they need um, in our city and in our province. And um, we also know, and it's been clearly indicated that 28 days uh, simply is just not long enough in terms of treatment for those who are struggling with severe and persistent substance use issues, specifically uh, with substances like meth, for example. And so, um, you know, I think the minister continues to point out beds that have been developed that are specific to 28 days. We know that's not long enough. It's not significant enough in that regard to address issues surrounding meth use. Um, what I'd like to know is the, what is the minister's plan to uh, create, or does the minister have a plan rather in regards to long-term treatment beds specific to youth um, in our province, in our city, these issues, like I've said before, rear their head much earlier than adulthood, and currently youth in our city and our province are really struggling to access the services that they need. I hear, I've heard that from youth on a daily basis in my constituency, in the constituency of Union Station, knocking on doors. I ran into many youth that I've worked with who are struggling with problematic substance use and addiction. So what is the minister's plan to, uh, to address um, long-term treatment options for youth beyond 28 days? The Honourable Minister. I'm a bit perplexed by the member's question. This was the exact same line of questioning by the member for Point Douglas going back as uh, far as Monday of this week. We've had hours and hours of converse, or Tuesday, perhaps Tuesday of this week. Monday of this week? I think it was Monday when we started in on Committee of Supply for Health, and I believe that on the very first day, questions specific to mental health and addictions uh, were asked, and those responses were added uh, were provided. Uh, so we have on record in the legislature now enhanced uh, discussion of many of these things. I would say asked and answered to the member, but I would also say that this opportunity then uh, will be given to me, I will use to further underscore the importance of investments uh, like our investment to establish telephone-based early intervention services for youth through our contract with Strongest Families Institute as announced in January of this year. This is brand new capacity for Manitoba. As a matter of fact, I believe Manitoba was one of the last jurisdictions in Canada uh, to have this kind of telephone-based specialized service, uh, very effective. This is a Canadian success story. Strongest Families Institute is not the only uh, organization in this space, but the record of success of this organization globally, domestically, based out of Nova Scotia, is incredible. And I agree with the member, exactly as they said, that too many times in Manitoba, and the Virgo report underscored this, the system, because of the linkage, uh, the, 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 the inability to link, uh, the wait time, and the lack of capacity and the lack of coordination, there would be in this system in an individual uh, the evidence of impairment or a problem or a challenge in respect of mental health, let's say with youth. Uh, there would be the demonstration of that somewhere socially, perceived perhaps by the individual's mother and father and caregivers, and the system, did what it could to, you know, respond, 
Perhaps the individual went to public health. Perhaps the individual went to a doctor, and they went on a wait list. But now, instead of going on a wait list, we can refer an individual to services under Strongest Families Institute. I believe in the first year of service, uh, the Strongest Families Institute online mental health services specific to youth will help 700 families, or perhaps, yes, yeah, 700 families per year. We've got a five-year partnership we entered into along with Bell Let's Talk that uh, makes as its goal the early addressing of these instances to stabilize, provide support, and provide that support for the whole family. There, there is um, a psychologist attached to the service, there are these clinicians that work directly with the family. There is curriculum they work through. There are homework assignments. There is dialogue, but it is flexible. And it's well, well suited for people in northern and rural Manitoba too. You don't have to drive to Winnipeg or Brandon. And the service is able to work in such a way that if mom or dad or the child are unavailable from the hours of 8 to 5 p.m., that then the system can be suited to them and the time periods that work well for them. Uh, there is incredible evidence of success. This is all evidence-based. Uh, it is best le and leading practice-based, and it works. And that is why in the campaign, we made a decision to double down and reinvest more in these services. So when the member asks, what is the government doing? More and more, based on the Virgo report, based on the evidence before us, making changes to the system, uh, and now kicking off those changes because the time is now, and we are moving forward urgently to put into place our Safer Streets, Safer Lives Action Plan. Yes, it is a justice issue, uh, the issues we see. Yes, they are health care issues. Yes, they are public health issues. Yes, they are community confidence issues. Yes, they are youth issues, and that is why our government is acting. The honourable member for Union Station. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have no further questions. No further questions. Okay. Uh, is everyone ready for the resolutions? Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll proceed. Uh, resol resolution two at twenty-one point two: Resolve that there be granted to Her Majesty a sum not exceeding fifteen million three hundred eighty-four thousand dollars for health, senior, and active living provincial policy and programs for the fiscal year ending March thirty-first, two thousand and twenty. Shall the resolution pass? Oh, we have uh, the honourable member for River Heights. Yes, I was. I wanted to say no. We're not ready for the resolution. Okay. I didn't. Okay. okay. Um, the honourable member for River Heights. You have a question. Um, the uh, well, what I wanted to say is that uh, from my position, from our party's position. Uh, that uh, we're not ready for this uh, resolution to happen. Uh, I'm still waiting for additional time, uh, and uh, the situation should have been handled in a way that I was able to get that additional time. And uh, I just want to make sure that uh, uh, this isn't uh, rammed through without any consideration, without any possibility of me getting some additional time for questions. Thank you. In the procedure of estimates here, um, the, it's, it's up to the, official, the critic of the official op opposition to um, have the discussion and, and um, actually ans answer questions. And it's up to the uh, independents and the um, opposition party to make, um, make, make basically uh, agreements that who is going to be asking questions at what time. So I would say that, uh, um, again, uh, it's, it's up to the, uh, the critic of the opposition. And, and the independent member should discuss it. And, and the independent member should discuss it with the critic. Member for River Heights. Yeah, member for River Heights. Thank uh, the uh, chair uh, for that. Uh, I have already discussed this with the critic for the official opposition. Uh, and I just want to put it on the record that I wanted uh, and had requested from the critic 
uh, additional time and uh, just to, so that uh, we as a Liberal Party can be treated fairly uh, and uh, I just leave it on the record and we'll leave it at that on this occasion uh, but it will stay on the record. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll, get, we'll, just, we'll just start this one all over again. Resolution 21.2, resolved that there be granted to Her Majesty a sum not exceeding $15,384,000 for health, senior, and active living, provincial policy, and programs for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. So, shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 21.3, resolved that there be granted to Her Majesty a sum exceeding, not exceeding, $10,469,000 for health, senior and active living, health, workforce, secretariat for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 21.4, resolved that there be granted to Her Majesty a sum not exceeding $45,764,000 for health, senior and active living, live, active living, Indigenous Relations, Population and Public Health for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 21.5, resolved that there be granted to Her Majesty a sum not exceeding $15,521,000 for health and senior and active living, regional policy and programs for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 21.6, resolved that there be granted to Her Majesty a sum not exceeding $42,877,000 for health, seniors, and active living, mental health and addictions, uh, primary health care and senior for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 21.7, resolved that there be granted to Her Majesty a sum not exceeding $5,850,059,000 for the health, senior, and active living, health services insurance fund for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 21.8, resolved that there be granted to Her Majesty a sum not exceeding $190,987,000 for the health and senior act and active living, capital funding for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is currently passed. Resolution 21.9. Resolved that there be granted to Her Majesty a, not, a sum not exceeding $4,275,000 for the health, senior, and active living costs related to capital assets for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is currently passed. Resolution 21.10. Resolved, resolved that there be granted to Her Majesty a sum not exceeding $970,000 for health, senior, and active living, capital assets for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is currently passed. The last item to be considered for the estimates for, the, for this department is the 21.1A, the minister's salary contained in resolution 21.1. At this point, I request that all, mini all ministerial and opposition staff leave the chamber for the consideration for this last item. The floor is open for questions. The Honourable Member for Union Station. Um, I'd like to move uh, a resolution. Oh, I move that. Uh, line item 21.1A be amended so that the Minister of Health, Seniors and Active Living salary be reduced to one dollar. It has been moved by the Honourable Member for Union Station that. 
It has been moved by the Honorable Member for Union Station that that line item number 21.1 be a be amended that the ministers and of, of health and senior and active living salary be reduced to one dollar. The motion is in order. Are there any questions or comments on the motion? Is the committee ready for the question? Shall the motion pass? No. I hear no. The court motion is accordingly defeated. Okay, the rest, uh, so it's resolution 21.1. Resolved that there be granted to Her Majesty a sum not exceeding $12,191,000 for health and senior health, senior and active living, administration and finance for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. This committee, uh, this completes the estimate for the Department of Health, Senior and Active Living. What is the will of the committee? To rise. Okay. The committee, the committee rise. Call in the speaker. The hour being 12.30 p.m., the House is now adjourned and stands adjourned until 1.30 p.m. on Monday.